This tutorial is entitled Why the Sigmoidal Emax Model is Special. This presentation will give an introduction to the Sigmoidal Emax Model and specifically the comparisons with simpler models. Then we're going to compare it with more complex models and to give a finally a summary. The Sigmoidal Emax Model is special. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, it's just a fantastic model for describing dose-response relationships. The equation is shown up here in the top right. If you come from a stats background, this model is the same as the four-parameter logistic model. It's just under a reparameterization. Why is this so useful? Well, the first thing that is, is so useful is that the parameters are meaningful. So we have the ED50, which is capturing the location of the dose response. Then we have the steepness of the hill coefficient, the gamma here, which measures how steep the dose response increases. And then we have the maximum effect, the Emax parameter here. We also can have an arbitrarily complex placebo model so that we can describe other things that are going on with the placebo data and then measure our drug effect on top of that. What are the two major criticisms or two, two criticisms of this model? The first is the monotonically increasing assumption. With this equation, higher doses will always lead to higher effects. We'll discuss how you can investigate that on the basis of the data that you see uh, via sensitivity analysis. Uh, a minor criticism would be that it's symmetric around ED50 on the log dose scale. We'll, we'll look at that as well. So to give an overview of the different parameters and their effect on the shape of the dose response, in the top left panel here, we have the variation in the E0, and E0 is simply shifting this curve up or down. So here with an E0 of 0, or 2, or 4, the whole curve just gets shifted up or down. When we talk about variation in the Emax, here we have an Emax of 2.5, a, a 5, and a 7.5. Over here, we're talking about the variation in the ED50, so it changes the location from 10 here in the middle to 20 down to 5. And the ED50 is the, the dose required to give 50% of the maximal effect. And finally, down here, we're looking at the hill coefficient, the hill coefficient of 1, 2, or 3. The higher the number, the steeper the curve. These all have the same ED50 of 10. The previous plot was shown on the log dose scale, here it is on the untransformed dose scale, and we see again this, this uh, typical profiles that we see with this model. So why not use other dose response models? Perhaps we can think about simpler models. So a very commonly used model is the simple Emax model, so not the sigmoidal Emax model. So therefore when the hill coefficient is fixed to 1, Another simpler model that I won't go into detail today, but I'll just mention now, is the log linear model. So back in the 70s and 80s, we often worked with linear type models because it was difficult to work with non-linear models. Now it is not difficult to work with non-linear models, so really log linear type models should be um, put in the past. So what about more complex models? For example, the Richards model. The sigmoidal Emax model is a, a nested model within the Richards model. Why would we not consider the Richards model? Or perhaps other alternatives like splines, so where the dose response is allowed to go up and down and, and up again perhaps. Uh, they are very flexible, uh, but perhaps they struggle with a pharmacological uh, interpretation. So I'm not going to talk a lot about splines at the moment. So when we think about the simple Emax model, the major problem is that it imposes an exact difference between the dose levels, which a priori we do not know. So here on the left, we have the, the simple Emax model. So the heel coefficient is fixed to one here. So therefore it's, it's gone away from the superscripts up here on dose and ED50. And we see that at the ED50, we get an effect of 50. And if we halve the dose, we get a third of the effect. And if we double the dose, we get two thirds of the effect. And if we go four times higher, we get 80% of the effect. And four times lower, we get 20% of the effect. 
So in terms of trying to understand how our drug works, we're often keen to understand the shape of this curve. Well, if we fix it with a hill of one, we're a priori saying we know these answers. Over here, we have the similar type of curve, but now with a hill coefficient of 1.5. And what we see is that the differences between these doses, as we go from 10 to 20, or from 20, say, down to five, there's a much larger change between these relative differences between the doses than suggested by the simple Emacs model. So here we're going from one third up to two thirds, so an effect of one third on the, of an Emacs amount. Over here we're going from around a quarter up to three quarters, so nearly half an increase in the maximum effect. So to give an example, let's think about the differences between two doses under a a hypothetical situation. So here we're looking at a difference between 20 milligram and 5 milligram. Here are our estimated parameters. So we have a, an E0 of 0, I've just made this nice and simple, an Emax of 1. We have the log E50 and the log hill, so it's often better to model these on the log scale. And we have, therefore have an ED50 of 10 and a hill coefficient of 1.5. If you typically did a walled statistic type test here, so the estimate divided by the standard error, you may conclude that this model isn't any better than perhaps fixing it straight to one. But I would argue against that. I would say that it's uh, just that you have potentially insensitivity in your data set. Just to explain these other things here, this is the variance covariance matrix. So this is where the standard errors are coming from the square root of the diagonal of the variance covariance matrix. So this perhaps is what you you found at the start. Now, if you decided to, you may look at that data and say, right, I'm gonna fix the hill coefficient, the log hill to zero, so the hill coefficient to one, and then I'm gonna re-estimate the other parameters. If we use this model to now determine the differences between five and 20, we come up with this distribution here. So we think that the, the typical difference between five and 20 is about 0.33, which is consistent with the, the previous graphs. And we get it's maybe a fifth percentile, a 95th percentile from 0.29 up to 0.36. One of the issues here is that these intervals that we're looking at here are completely inconsistent with what we're getting from this model here. So when we say that we honestly do not know the estimate of the, the hill coefficient, we use its its estimated parameter and its uncertainty, we end up with a very wide range of predicted differences between 20 milligram and five milligram. And here we see that the mean is about 0.46. And this is completely inconsistent with the, when we fix the hill coefficient to one. So really, just because we have a lack of information here on the precision of the hill coefficient, we're going to conclude a very, we're very confident about the size of the differences between 5 and 20, when the reality is that we really don't know a lot about the differences between 5 and 20, and we should reflect that. So a summary of why we should not use the simple Emacs model. Essentially, it's just too simple. Understanding the relative differences between doses is a key measure we wish to estimate. By fixing the Hill coefficient to 1, we're saying we know something when in fact we don't. I think this old-fashioned method of testing if the hill coefficient is equal to one uh, is not good practice. When the data is weak, so when we have a large standard error on the hill coefficient, we'll be more likely to make this strict assumption. So this is paradoxical. We're saying so when we have less information, we're more sure that the hill coefficient is one. And again, here I've just given this idea of a, a hill coefficient with a standard error. If we compare this versus one, we're going to conclude that it is indeed exactly equal to one. That's not a good conclusion. So as a summary, I think you should always look to estimate the hill coefficient and recognize that this parameter and its uncertainty will honestly capture the relative differences between the doses. Why not a more complex model like the Richards model? So unlike the sigmoidal Emacs model, it allows a symmetry above and below the ED50, controlled by the, the V parameter. There's a number of different parameterizations for the Richards model. So here in red, we have a heel coefficient of equal to two with the V parameter equal to one. So this is essentially the nested structure. When V is one, it's a sigmoidal Emacs model. So this is the red line here. 
And if I cut out this, this part of the curve here and flipped it over, it would be the same as the red curve up here. Whereas if we contrast it when, when the V parameter is equal to 4, we see that the, the green curve and the red curve are quite similar here, but down at the bottom end, there's more of a separation. So the, the Richards model is allowing this asymmetry in the shape of this curve here, relative to the sigmoidal Emacs model. I think one of the things when you, when you look at this plot is that it looks like the hill coefficient is changing. So here, when we have a hill coefficient of two with the red, we see that with the green, it looks just like it's a bit steeper. Whereas with the blue, when the V parameter is 0.25, it looks like the hill coefficient is flatter. So we can think about what would happen if we estimated the model when the V parameter was 0.25 using a simple sigmoidal Emacs model. So that's what we've done here. And essentially the biases from applying a sigmoidal Emacs model to a true Richards model is generally very small. So here, the true model we've taken from the previous graph is it's the Richards model with a hill equals to two and with V equals 0.25. If we fit that data, uh, we get a sigmoidal Emacs model fit with a hill equals to one which is the black line here. The deviation of the differences, so that they, the lack of fit that we get from this is this difference here, which is shown down here. So at a maximum, it's around 0.06. And sometimes it's, it's still spot on. And over here, it's spot on. Typically, we're gonna be in this range around ED50 to three or four times ED50. And we're about maybe three or 4% out at most. So it's not particularly a large lack of fit here. The other side, when we have a, a slightly steeper looking relationship with the V parameter equal to 4, now we're getting a sigmoidal max fit with a hill of 2.63, even though the true model here is a Richards model with a hill of 2 and V equals 4. And we see here that the lack of fit, again, is very small. It's only maybe 2% and 2% here. So it's doing actually a very good job of describing this curve. So really, the, when we apply a sigmoidal max model to a true Richards model, Generally, the amount that we're going to be out is not too much. So a summary of why we should not, in general, plan to use the Richards model. A sigmoidal max model fit to a true Richards model is not particularly poor, especially if the data is across the dose range. It is extremely unlikely that most clinical data would ever be able to differentiate between the Richards model and the sigmoidal max model. Those differences there are very, very small. So it would be very hard to get enough of a data set that would actually be able to challenge that reliably. Finally, it's already challenging to plan to use the sigmoidal Emacs model. If you're trying to estimate all of those parameters, the Emacs, the ED50 and the hill coefficient, it already requires large study sizes. That's whilst in general, I think considering more than a single model type may be desirable, I think it's very optimistic to plan to use the Richards model. We talked about a couple of criticisms of the sigmoidal Emax model. The most uh, obvious one is the monotonically increasing assumption. Well, one, one solution is sensitivity analysis. So here, one thing I would, I would mention right at the start is that monotonically increasing dose responses may look non-monotonic. So here I've simulated data under the, the black curve for our hypothetical phase two study, and we observe the red. These are the red is the point estimates and the 95% confidence intervals. And we see that perhaps the model fit would be something similar to the true profile here. But perhaps someone may say, well, actually, we see that this effect is going up and we really do believe that actually it may be coming down. So therefore, the, the, the model fit from the black line is actually a little bit wrong. We could perhaps think about looking to downweight the effect of this 32 milligram effect to get this curve to start coming back up. And one simple way to do that would be to increase the Emax, and we start getting a fit more like this. The goal here would be to present both sets of results. So we present the results which on the, the model based on the left, and then we present the model based on the right. And we see if the conclusions in terms of dose selection would be sensitive to which model we looked at. So a summary of why the sigmoidal Emax model is the best choice for dose response modeling in phase two and phase three, I would say as well. I think it's an excellent model for combining data across doses. Importantly, it allows an accurate estimation of the differences between doses. 
which is really going to help us when we're trying to talk about the utility of different doses versus each other in terms of efficacy and safety. The two main assumptions can be assessed, so the monotonically increasing assumption can be assessed using sensitivity analysis. Fixing Emacs to a value of choice is one solution there. And the symmetry, if we want to investigate the trends of the residuals versus dose to look for any lack of fit across the dose range, or indeed if your data is really, really great, you could consider estimating the Richards model. So I hope I've clearly demonstrated why the sigmoidal Emacs model is a very useful model for dose response analysis. I hope you found this video interesting. If so, you may want to check out our other videos. If you have any comments or suggestions, please feel free to contact me.